Guys, with that, we're going to go ahead and, and get started. Um, I'm excited to introduce um, Colonel Candace Frost, who is on her final days and hours of being a, 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 a Fed. Um, we're going to be having a fireside chat um, uh, titled Resilient Mission Dominance, Understanding the Global Threat Landscape. Um, most of you know Colonel Frost, but if you are not familiar with her background, she's a commander of the Joint Intelligence Operations Center at Cyber Command, um, where she's responsible for providing and producing the intelligence required to support the Cyber Commander and staff subordinate command com component commands, joint task forces, and the national intelligence community. Uh, she received her commission from the United States Military Academy at West Point, branching into military uh, intelligence within the US Army, and has received numerous awards and, de uh, and decorations. I'd be remiss not to mention that she was actually one of our honorees at the ICIT Gala in uh, November, which we're really, really happy to acknowledge. Um, so please help me in welcoming uh, Colonel Frost to the stage. Can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. All right. Perfect. Uh, Candace, Colonel Frost, good to see you again. Thank you. Yeah. You as well. We had a great conversation this morning. Um, you know, the, we're here to talk about, and, and I believe the w one of the two countries that came up this morning was China. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and the other one, as you can imagine, is, is Russia. So, um, you know, you, you have a fascinating background. We've talked about this before. Maybe start by talking about what the emerging threats are that you see which pose the greatest risk today to our nation and our national security. Well, definitely, um, as the Air Force likes to say, China, China, China. Um, I, I think the, the greatest aspect, of people in this room, if you haven't read the book Chip War by Chris Miller, that really goes into great detail of, you know, even from years past when we started in Silicon Valley all the way to today, what are the impacts? and the slight nuances that we see with respect to China that sometimes we don't even know are in existence. Um, as I kind of work to prognosticate in the, in the job that I'm in looking forward in China, uh, they have built, you know, we, we kind of would like uh, to build our STEM components in our education system. They have gone full bore press with respect to about 50% of their college educated graduates are in some type of STEM field. And it, and it starts from there and just goes, all the way to um, manufacturing, um, the things that they've done with the Belt and Road Initiative and critical components and pieces and um, parts of um, kind of mining that, that we've seen as well in portions of Africa or East Asia are, are incredibly important. And as our nation focuses on, on different areas, we've not necessarily kept that same type of focus um, that China has to look at the long game. And I think, America has done a great job of moving forward with the CHIPS Act. That is a great step. We just need to have almost a, a whole of government understanding that the impact that China can have. Um, but then there's a balance, right? We have to understand the economy. The world is no longer siloed. As much as we'd like to say everything that we buy American is American, um, the world and globalization have, have changed the way we do things. And, and it makes it really, really hard. So we look at partnerships. Um, especially in the job that I have for, I think, five more hours. I'm changing command today. Um, so the, the work that we have done with other NATO nations and other, I think we've extended well beyond NATO in the Asia Pacific region, um, to work together and to coordinate it is critical um, with respect to China. Yeah, and, and, and um, you mentioned kind of the, the, the long game China plays. It really is important to, um, you know, what we were talk, talking about this morning as well, for the U.S. And, and its allies to understand the strategy that they're deploying, not just China, but some other nation state adversaries as well, and to develop, develop our own uh, long-term plans and what it means from a technology perspective, from a strategic alliance perspective, from an economic perspective. There's so many layers to this to make sure that we can effectively compete um, in, in the, in the uh, kind of a, a growing economy. 
And the competitiveness is so important because we don't want to squash innovation. I think that's that's a critical part um, in the in the DC bubble. We definitely don't see it as much. Those that leave the bubble um, understand it's a joke. I'm trying. It's early. Well, we haven't had enough coffee, I guess. Um, I love DC, but we, when we go to different areas, whether it's a garage and you know somewhere in Silicon Valley um, or somewhere in Austin, Texas, you start to see the small business and the ability to scratch the itch of trying to create what's next. Um, we don't want to make it so hard that that innovation is squashed by this giant massive part of the S word security. Um, we've got to be able to kind of work collaboratively to, to show them easier ways not to have China steal their intellectual property and also to be able to bake security in so that when they come to the government we can you know, work on those nice contracts that, that we'd like to get there faster with them. Yeah. And really quick, um, AV team, could you get the timer started, please, and maybe set, reset it to 15 minutes? Thank you. Otherwise, I'd be looking at my phone. You'll think I'm being rude, but it's, it's, it's a clock. It's all good. <laughs> um, so you, 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 you mentioned emerging technology and kind of innovation. Um, uh, artificial intelligence, right? Top of mind yeah. for everybody. Um, I had a great conversation with my friend Rob last night about for an hour about the impact it's having on every aspect of life. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on it, and, and, and what are you able to share with regards to um, the government's, you know, kind of perspective on, on how it'll impact our national security. Um, what are the threats, and 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 also how are we going to be leveraging this technology to be more uh, competitive, uh, you know, uh, uh, with war fighters and just with with um, with the services for citizens. I think um, when we look at artificial intelligence, it's just like you, when the internet started, right? And some people were like, this is the end of the world, this is doomsday, and the other like, it's the greatest creation that you know, DARPA's ever come up with. So, or IARPA. So the pendulum will swing back and forth with respect to government. Uh, I, I definitely see right now that people are very concerned in the cybersecurity world with respect to you know, script kiddies or the people at the very novice stage being able to act as if they have a PhD in getting on our networks and unfortunately um, the amount of theft that we've seen in, in very loosely uh, controlled areas like schooling, um, unfortunately water systems, when we look at those things in critical infrastructure, we've seen an enormous amount of cyber criminals in, in those areas. And so they may be able to move faster, um, unfortunately with AI because of the opportunities that it has. But that also means though our defenders can move a little bit faster. So the, you know, the cat and mouse almost, the back and forth, um, AI will be able to, to explain and bring things much faster and further forward. I think what's great about AI is that it, it negates some of the administrative functions that are just so exhausting, especially to analysts. If I can do the cut and paste, those, those horrible, you know, tedious details much faster and I can get analysts to the thinking part of it where I need creative, critical, and um, impactful decisions to be made, that's where it's so important. You know, the, the human on the outside of the loop, there doesn't have to be in the loop all the time doing the control C, control V. Instead, they're on the outside helping to make the decision and to pivot it in the right direction. That's where the beauty of AI enters in. Um, there's also a, a huge amount of, I, I love what AI could do in the medical field. And to me, that's the most advantageous area. I hope that um, we as a nation lean into because it, it really will be able to help um, physicians and people that are in the research field move much faster and hopefully um, find better cures. Yeah, well, I, I believe um, what we were talking about last night, that last week there was a new cancer drug that was identified uh, through AI. They thought it was going to take you know, two, three years, and, uh, and it took a matter of, I believe, weeks or months. And so I think we're seeing it. What, what, what about on the, on, the, on the risk side? I mean, we're, um, uh, I was just talking to a, a, a kind of a seed stage uh, startup um, th whose cybersecurity solution is actually defending and protecting the algorithms from being compromised um, versus kind of the, the networks. And so we're seeing now uh, conversations and an evolution. Uh, and I think it's because we as a society have been talking about cybersecurity now for about, mm -hmm. what, a decade maybe? And so, you know, we're finally starting to think about these things. We're not slowing down the adoption piece per se, but, you know, w w what about how to keep um, these technologies, uh, uh, whether it's the, the code itself or the application secure um, from, from adversaries? So I think the, the biggest part is it's really the algorithm itself, you know, um, not tacking on security, but baking it in when, it, when it's created. We saw that with OpenAI and then of course the acquisition by Microsoft. By the way, this is Candace Frost speaking, not in 
Colonel Frost. Um, I'm not speaking on behalf of the United States government when I mention a US corporation. Uh, but see, legal. There's a couple lawyers in here. You get what I'm putting down. Um, but when, when we saw how that was created and then how Microsoft really kind of grabbed a hold of that, I think we'll see larger tech companies also work to, to grab hold. What, what I have been amazed at seeing is the proliferation of AI in any field you can go on to now. And it's exploded. At the rate of change has just phenomenally um, moved much faster than I think most of us would have expected. And uh, the, the release of so many different AI tools. And what's worrisome is that in this ecosystem of all these new um, arenas that are out there, people could be just, we are, we're Americans, we trust. And we put an enormous amount of data into something that we don't necessarily know. Where is this tacked on to? You know, is it a Kaspersky system? Um, is Huawei the one that's sponsoring this, this AI project that, that's out there? Um, we don't always have the greatest amount of data. And, um, and that, that could be the bothersome part. Because we want to move faster, especially business. But where you're putting your, your, your critical um, Bits and, bits and pieces could really could really matter. Tesla is feeling that right now with I photos. Thought, I thought it was ironic when the Chinese sky balloon, uh, spy balloon was happening that it, it was on Twitter that everyone was losing their mind and they didn't see the irony in the fact of they're talking about privacy on Twitter, which is kind of a, a hot topic right now. Yes. Um, I, so, I so, <laughs> on Twitter of all places, and they probably made some TikToks. That's exactly so, right. yeah. you know, they, yeah, yeah. they shared with everyone. Um, the uh, switching gears a little bit, and we talked about this this morning, um, um, obviously, we're here to talk about modernization um, and how to accelerate modernization. Um, legacy systems pose a major national security risk. We talk about this all the time. What are the roadblocks you see as it relates to um, modernizing uh, some of our legacy systems? Uh, and again, how are nation states going to be exploiting maybe some of these roadblocks? Are the, is it technology? Is it procurement, which we talked about mm -hmm. all morning? Is it just culture? So I, I think there are several roadblocks, and then I'll, then I'll go to ways to remove them. Um, some of the big roadblocks are just the people our, ourselves, right? We get used to a particular system. Um, human nature tells us we like doing things over and over again, and so I am comfortable with X, Y, Z um, way to format, and making a change is hard. And we talked about even large corporations, 7% fail, that's, that's pretty tough. Um, so it's that side of the house, human nature, the technology, um, getting through the cumbersome acquisition process. I respect companies that make it all the way through. You really should get gold ribbons because it is, it's tough. Uh, but that, that side of it, there, there's nothing fast. And then the, the culture of why would we have to change? It, it's a budget, right? If we look at a palm cycle and how fast money moves, which is not very fast, um, and the government, uh, how can you project that, that far ahead? Now, on the flip side, what are things that have, that have happened that are going to make a difference? Um, zero trust. That is really going to be, hopefully, the forcing function that, that I see as it is, because it's set a benchmark of 10 years to move that technology. And in, in 10 years, we are going to be to, and I do understand zero trust is not zero, I mean, 100% security. But at least if we're moving in that direction, that will start, it's a forcing function to get some of this really old IT uh, off the systems, especially in the Department of Defense that I speak to, but also in the government writ large. I think that'll be a big motivator to, to move things along. Um, we just have to, we have to really start to show demonstrable change. Yeah. And I think some of the, hopefully, um, this may be more applicable on the private sector side, but some of the regulations with requiring cybersecurity experts on boards, I think, you know, right. with those folks there, um, it, it, it blows my mind how many major organizations just continuously um, delay investment in, in modernizing legacy tech. And, um, and it's probably because at the, at the executive level, there's not that advocacy happening to educate, to your point, about some of these issues. But that's where we'll probably have Collins write another book about Southwest. And he can talk about the failure of not doing this over and over again. Um, that we'll have business, business lessons from uh, Harvard, Harvard Business Review come out and really show that. Um, and hopefully, companies will take lessons from that. Yeah, uh, and, and, and another thing that we've talked about, you've mentioned this today and we talked about this morning, was stakeholder engagement and, and, and the role in which your partners, whether it's internal or external, play in mission dominance. And so what are some of the ways in, in, in all the work you've done, you obviously work with so many stakeholders, 
what are your kind of practical um, implementable strategies and, and, and tactics to create trusted relationships? I mean, how, how, do you, how do you foster that, that, that trust? So I, I think the biggest arena that I have seen in Department of Defense employees like myself, picture me in a uniform now in that picture, um, I, I've started to go and kind of encourage my peers and especially other individuals in government to not be afraid of industry. I, I think we are taught for so long, don't talk to media and don't talk to any vendors. Then you'll be safe, right? You can make GO, general officer then. Um, but that's a horrible way to look at it because then you only stay in your silo of where you're at. If you don't go forward and engage with different companies, corporations, vendors, you start to understand. Bring people with you, and this is what I would do as, as a leader. I would bring my tech experts. If I knew I needed something with respect to open source intelligence, I have a general understanding, right? A mile wide and an inch deep. That's the way kernels think. But I've got a great tech expert who is a true hedgehog and who could dive down into the nuts and bolts of it. Um, bringing them along to places like RSA, the conference, I guess, next week, uh, and would really open my eyes to, hey, here are some of the products, and these are people we should talk to as we're starting to explore this space. Um, that was very helpful, and it kind of built a generation of people that worked as subordinates to me to kind of see, hey, this is okay, and this is how you should, you should act in government. We need more people to do that. The second part I'd ask for industry is, please be patient with us. Um, I'm writing my change of command speech, and I was like, oh, 200,000 emails on average. Um, so I, I say refresh. Um, it's not that we, we ignore. It's just sometimes there are so information. We are just inundated by information. Um, so those still small moments in a, in a place like this where you can have a conversation, take full advantage of being able to talk through the things that you have, the ideas, the applicability here and now, versus um, always writing it in an email, because sometimes it can get lost in the shuffle. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, in the final few minutes, um, kind of switch, switching gears and talking about leadership, it's such an important, it goes to what you just mentioned. Um, we really believe, and, and I believe, that you know, leadership is pervasive. It exists at every level of an organization. What, what um, kind of advice do you have, particularly for those folks who are maybe earlier in their careers and looking to um, reach um, uh, kind of higher levels and having more responsibility. Um, how do they become better leaders and, and, and how do you define that? And, and, and when you think about the leaders who have inspired you and motivated you, what are some of those characteristics that they should be focused on? I think that one of their, uh, boy, that's like my PhD level question, but, uh, but I'll say a couple yeah, of minutes. things. There you go, two minutes, ready, go. Um, the first, oh, we're still a rough audience. It's okay, it's okay, I got two minutes. I'm gonna lean in. You should have a Bloody Mary bar. There we go, time. that's it. That'll really, you know, mimosas. Um, so, so what I'd say about leadership, don't drink in public. Uh, no, the second thing I, I'd say about leadership is really uh, understanding yourself. To, to be a great leader, especially people that are just entering in the field, you need to know your strengths and weaknesses. And you can spend all day um, trying to overcome your weakness, but at no point am I gonna be able to dunk a basketball. My son, who is 6'3", can do it easily, right? So I give the ball to him. Um, know where you have, um, you know, find your greatness, really. Um, bringing forward those areas that you can excel and then also finding a mentor. I, I can't say enough the, the importance of whatever location you find yourself right now is that to bring others along, you've got to also lean in and help them out. So um, sponsorship and mentorship are what creates really diverse teams. But you can't sponsor someone if you don't go out there and start to collect great ideas and talk to different people in different fields. Um, some introverts, especially though, those I work at the NSA most days, and that is the home bed for introverts. Um, yeah, imagine being an extrovert in an introvert world. It's kind of tough. Um, I'm the one that looks at other people's shoes. So that's an NSA joke if you, if you get it. Um, so, but but understanding how to be able to bring people out, it, it's really important to start to network. And even though if you are an introvert of all introverts, find a way that you can network in your own special way. Um, creating different communities is incredibly important. And last but not least, when I talk about mentoring, try to mentor people who don't look like you, walk like you, and talk like you. Um, we don't want Xerox copies in your organization because that doesn't bring unique and different ideas. That's what makes innovation so great. 
You don't want the same person. Definitely, yes sir, yes sir, yes ma'am, yes ma'am. How do you create change? It's by thinking differently and questioning things. So I'd encourage um, each of us to kind of lean into that and think, you know, writing down, hey, these are the people that I mentor and these are the people that mentored me. How can I do and pass along the torch to the next generation? Yeah. And with it, that, we are at time. We're at time. <laughs> and I'll tell you, it took me too long to understand the value of mentorship. And as soon as I asked, in five years, my, you know, I've taken a different trajectory. It really is impactful. It yeah. truly, truly is, yeah. Um, well, everyone, we're unfortunately out of time. Uh, Colonel Frost, thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.